In the early days of World War II, the serene waters of Mers el Kabir, a French naval base in North Africa, were shattered by a sight that defied belief. British warships, allies turned aggressors, looming on the horizon. Admiral Marcel Bruno Jean Soule, commander of the largest French Navy force in the Mediterranean, faced an unthinkable choice. The British had come with an ultimatum. Surrender the ships, scuttle them, or flee to America. Churchill had made his stance clear. He would sooner sink the French Navy than let it fall into German hands. The tension was palpable, the stakes impossibly high. Refusal meant war, not with a common enemy, but with a friend turned foe. As the small British ship approached the port, carrying the ultimatum that would test the bonds between former allies, the French sailors watched, their hearts pounding, their breaths held. The impending decision would challenge alliances and set a course for a confrontation no one saw coming. Hitler's annexation to former Prussian Empire territories in the 1930s led to rising tensions with France, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union. War loomed on the horizon. Everyone knew it would happen. It was only a matter of when. The Third Reich tried to negotiate with Poland the aperture of a railway network to connect Eastern Prussia with the rest of Germany through the disputed territory of Danzig. Meanwhile, the UK and France agreed that neither nation would negotiate a peace treaty if a war ever broke out against Germany. They were all in until the very end. Furthermore, both countries secretly promised immediate military aid to Poland if the German armed forces invaded their country, following the Polish government's refusal to concede to Hitler's political claims. However, such aid never came after the German invasion of Poland in September 1939. France and the UK declared war against Germany, but there was no mass mobilization of troops. Instead, the Western Front fell into the hiatus of the so-called phony war. The French occupied a small portion of the German border, but there were no intense combat operations against the Wehrmacht. The UK dispatched the British Expeditionary Force in northern France and awaited the enemy. Hitler offered peace to both countries as Germany and the Soviet Union split Poland. The Allies refused, and the Wehrmacht readied itself for war. German U-boats from the Kriegsmarine began to sink ship after ship that attempted to break into the North Sea, and then slowly moved into the Atlantic to decimate any merchant ships carrying supplies and weapons for the UK. The German submarines became an immediate threat to the British Royal Navy, and it decided to act accordingly by developing a naval plan with the help of the French Navy. The French Navy, or La Royale, was the world's fourth largest naval power and the second largest in Europe behind the Royal Navy, with over 740,000 tons split between different warships. The other two powerful navies belonged to the United States and the Empire of the Rising Sun. The Kriegsmarine, although effective, could not win a fight against the combined numbers of the British and the French. Thus, with their naval forces united, French Admiral Francois Darlan proposed his British counterpart, Sir Dudley Pound, split their navies for maximum effectiveness. La Royale would take charge of the Mediterranean, protecting its North African possessions from Germany and Italy. In contrast, the Superior Royal Navy would take hold of the Atlantic to halt the German forces. Pound refused, arguing the tide of the war at sea would take place in the Atlantic, not the Mediterranean. He was not wrong, but Darlan still won the argument. France could not afford to lose its African colonies, with the ambitious Benito Mussolini and his Regia Marina lurking around the corner. The overconfidence of the Allies cost them dearly. By the summer of 1940, the full might of the German armed forces was unleashed with the dashing blitzkrieg campaigns of Western Europe. Belgium, the Low Countries, Denmark, Norway, and then France were swiftly overwhelmed by the combined strength of the German infantry, armored divisions, and the Luftwaffe. The French army and the British Expeditionary Force were overrun once the Germans overcame the defenses of the Maginot Line. Following retreat after retreat, the British Expeditionary Force was pushed back to Dunkirk and completely encircled by German armored divisions and Luftwaffe fighters. On May 10, 1940, the British retreated from Europe, leaving tons of military supplies at the beaches of Dunkirk. That very same day, after suffering this major retreat, Winston Churchill became Britain's Prime Minister and quickly reminded the French of their treaty. Neither nation could surrender without the other's agreement. Fate was about to decide otherwise. The British and French navies were scattered, and the French army did not hold for long without additional foreign help. On June 14, 1940, German troops entered Paris unopposed. 
the French army collapsed and part of the government fled, but others remained. Realizing the two nations had accorded no separate peace, French Prime Minister Paul Renault decided to consult Churchill about the possibility of signing an armistice with Germany. Churchill reluctantly agreed, as long as the Accords allowed the French Navy to set sail for the British Isles to prevent it from falling into Germany's hands. Nevertheless, the substitution of Renault for World War I hero Marshal Philippe Pétain changed the outcome. On June 22, 1940, at the Compagnie, the French government, led by Pétain, signed an armistice with the Third Reich. As a consequence, France was divided into two zones. The northern half of the country fell under German control. At the same time, the south and the rest of the French colonies overseas were left to the new Vichy government, led by Pétain. Regarding the state of the French Navy, Article 8 of the Armistice stated, quote, The German government solemnly and firmly declares that it has no intention of making demands regarding the French fleet during the peace negotiations. As long as the French vessels returned to their home ports, their crews reduced, and most of their ammunition surrendered, the Reich had no interest in the French fleet. Only those necessary to maintain control of France's colonial waters were left alone. Germany put little pressure on the new government. Besides the ships in France, others were left alone without restrictions, including those in the ports of Dakar, Alexandria, and most importantly, Meres al Kabir. Nevertheless, Churchill and the Royal Navy were still uneasy. The French ships could be taken by the Regia Marina and the Kriegsmarine at any time, greatly boosting the number of Axis warships and overcoming the numerical superiority of the Royal Navy. If that ever happened, Britain was doomed, and Churchill and the Admiralty were unwilling to let it happen. French Navy Minister Admiral Francois Darlan assured Churchill no French ship would ever be used against Britain and ordered his Atlantic fleet to Toulon. Meanwhile, the British urged all the French Navy vessels in North Africa to continue the war against Germany, despite the armistice recently signed. The largest concentration of ships from the Marine Nationale was in Africa, specifically Oran, Algeria, and Mers el Kabir. This force was under the command of Admiral Marcel Bruno Jean Soule. It consisted of six destroyers, seaplane tender Commandant Testa, the old battleships Britannia and Provence, and the new battle cruisers Dunkirk and Strasbourg, of which Churchill was deeply concerned. Consequently, Churchill and the Admiralty launched Operation Catapult, forced the French to surrender their North African fleet on good terms and retreat to the UK or be attacked and neutralized by the Royal Navy. Admiral James Somerville, based in Gibraltar and commander of Force H, was ordered to deliver the ultimatum to the French. The demand specified that Jean Soule's squadron could either join the Royal Navy in the fight against the Axis, sail to a British port with reduced crews to be interned, sail to the West Indies or the United States until the end of the war, or scuttle the ships within four hours of receiving the message. Force H comprised battlecruiser HMS Hood, carrier HMS Ark Royal, battleships HMS Valiant and HMS Resolution, 11 destroyers, and two light cruisers. The task force sailed from Mers al Kabir. Somerville dispatched Captain Cedric Holland on July 3, 1940, to deliver the ultimatum to Jean Soule. Mers el Kabir, or the Great Harbor, located in northwestern Algeria, had been a port town since the 12th century and under French occupation since 1830. Besides its capacity to house a large fleet, the port's natural harbor was sheltered from east winds and breakwaters. Captain Holland, a fluent French speaker, was received coldly by the French, who had already spotted Force H and were ready for war. Already mad by the sight of the Royal Navy ships, Jean Soul felt insulted. The British had dared to send a low-ranking officer to parley with an admiral. He was not willing to receive the man. Still, the clock was ticking, and tensions were quickly rising. Holland miraculously managed to be received by Jean Soule after he dashed toward the French flagship Dunkirk. The British dropped sea mines at the port entrance to prevent the French from receiving reinforcements. Darlan could not be contacted about the ultimatum. By 5.25 p.m., Churchill sent a teletype to Somerville that said, quote, Settle matters quickly. He then informed Jean Soule that the fleet would be attacked if the ultimatum was not accepted within 15 minutes. The Admiral was unwilling to negotiate under the threat of enemy fire and did not respond to Somerville. Holland then left Jean Soule and his staff with a cordial farewell. War soon followed at 5.54 p.m. when the British ships opened fire from over 10 miles away from the port. The French ships, anchored, had little freedom to maneuver, while the British had plenty. The powerful armament of Dunkirk and Strasbourg was forward, and it took them a long time to target the enemy ships. 
It was not a fair fight at all. Force H heavily pounded the French ships mercilessly. The third salvo from the British vessels hit Britannia in her magazine, sinking her at 6 p.m. While the French struggled to move, Force H maneuvered to avoid being hit and made direct hits on Provence, badly damaging her and Dunkirk. She was run aground to prevent the ship from sinking and put out of action four minutes into the fight. Despite the mounting losses, the French fought fiercely to defend their ships from the treacherous attack of their allies. Mogador lost her stern in the following minutes, and two other destroyers received multiple hits, rendering them useless for combat. While the rest of the fleet was decimated by the British warships and aircraft, Strasbourg and three destroyers managed to avoid the harbor mines and make way for the open ocean in a desperate attempt to survive. They were furiously hunted down by swordfish bombers from HMS Ark Royal and pursued by other vessels from Force H. Nevertheless, the British were stopped by the arrival of four French Moran Saunier MS-406 fighters at 7.10 a.m. and nine others that showed up shortly after and engaged their former allies in dogfights above the port. This gave Strasbourg and the three destroyers enough time to escape the pursuit and reach Toulon the next day. Still, chaos continued at Mers el Kabir. French anti-aircraft gunners did their best to fend off the British aircraft, preventing them from bombing the entire area. While the surface vessels were scattered and damaged with increasing salvos, four French submarines emerged from the depths to sink Force H. They were detected by Somerville and had to flee the area to avoid being destroyed by depth charges. This led to the end of the battle, resulting in the loss of 1,297 French sailors, 250 wounded, and over a dozen British casualties. On July 8th, the British arrived at the port again to deal a death blow to Dunkirk and Provence and put them out of commission for good. The French retaliated with a strike on Gibraltar, but it was futile, resulting in minimal damage. Darlan sought war with Britain, but was appeased by Pétain. Nevertheless, Anglo-French relations were strained for good, leading many Frenchmen to enlist in the German army and Waffen-SS to avenge their brother's loss at Mers el-Kabir. <laughs>